got a full house here today. Um, do we need to take attendance or are we just taking it up from the screen? So, uh, Mr. Chair, the only one that we are um, missing right now is RJ. RJ. And, um, he may join us later. He had something come up. So otherwise, uh, all the members are here. We're good to go. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, um, I'm sure everybody has had a look at the agenda. So um, we'll uh, start with declaration of interest. I don't think, is there a need for it at this time? I don't think so. So we can carry on with the, uh, with the reports. Um, I think Philly, you're on the agenda there, go ahead. Philly, you're on mute. Yeah. I'm having some trouble with, with internet. So it was a bit droppy. So I hope you're able to hear me. Um, I'll do my best and um, just speak up. Someone let me know if I'm, if I'm dropping out. Um, and thanks, John. Um, and nice to see all of your faces. So I will um, do some presentations on some of the ongoing projects that we have um, in economic development, specifically related to agriculture and food right now, starting with Connect On. Uh, Connect On is a provincial program that's been going on for about five years now, mapping the uh, agri-food value chain um, and the manufacturing sector across Ontario. Um, the partners include the Golden Horseshoe Food and Farming Alliance, who um, were the ones who created the map in the first place, and then they partnered with OMAFRA. And we are um, adding our agri-food and manufacturing data thanks to a partnership through the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus and a red grant that they got. So um, Connect On is attempting to uh, create sustainability across those sectors by providing data and building connections and identifying gaps and opportunities and measuring economic impacts. And the way they're doing that is by making information available to us at the municipal level that we can access at Gray County. Um, and also we have signed on a member of staff at every one of our member municipalities and at our business enterprise center and um, at Catapult as well, so that we can all get in and add and update and download and analyze data as we need it around those specific sectors. So um, we built our agri-food asset map three and a half years ago to be um, compliant with Connect On so that we could do a data dump of our unique information into theirs. Um, what's exciting is we will have for the first time through a data sharing agreement access to the OMAFRA farm registration data, which is fantastic because right now our agri-food asset map has been opt-in only. So only those farms who wanted to be promoted to the public through our map are listed. What this sharing is going to allow us to do is see who is actually farming, what they're farming and how, and what the economic impacts are without us putting that out to the public because this is all hidden from the public because of, as I say, it's just municipal users. So we get at least 1200 additional data points that are going to help us with our decision-making and our planning. So it's really exciting. I sent off the batch of unique information that they did not already have um, uh, earlier in the week, sent off my very final copy of that. There were over 200 unique listings to add to what they already had. So when it all comes back, we're going to have amazing information that we can um, use in-house and also offer back to the public. Those that want to be uh, visible to the public will continue to be visible to the public on the agri-food asset map. But what's the exciting thing is we've just done a big data hygiene um, project there. So. Everything's going to be clean and fresh and, and um, usable in the next couple of months. We are going to be training municipal staff in early April. So um, next up is the um, Agricultural Specialist High Skills Major Program, uh, which everyone knows colloquially as Chesley Ag Program. So background on the program, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us know it, but just in a nutshell, it is a 
high school cooperative program that takes place in grades 11 and 12 where students learn about everything related to agriculture from animal sciences, livestock production, horticulture, greenhouse, veterinary, marketing, crop sciences, soil sciences, anything to do with, with farming um, up to and including agricultural business planning. Um, this program has been offered for the last 16 years at Chesley and when the high school uh, grades were eliminated from that school, it was moved over to OSDSS where it has been less successful simply because the operations of the um, demonstration farm are still at Chesley and students have to get themselves there. So um, that has made sustainability a problem. So um, we, at the county, so staff from Economic Development and Planning met on February 8th with three people, Dale Ahrens, who's the retired principal at Chesley and wants to see the program continue, Dennis Watson, who currently runs the Agricultural Specialist High Skills major program, and Larry Parkins from the Agricultural Committee that's working to build out the new fairground center next to Green Roots Museum. Um, and we discussed a possible solution through a partnership between the school board Gray County, Gray Roots Museum, and the Agricultural Societies to move the Chesley Agricultural Program to a combined location at Gray Roots Museum and the new Agricultural Fairgrounds. So what that would look like is using the barn for animals and the schoolhouse for in-class at Morston Village, using the Delton Becker Room, um, the theater and the cafe potentially inside Gray Roots Museum main building itself, and the installation of seasonal greenhouses on the new fairground site and also potentially crop uh, experimental crop plots, which really aligns with what they want to do there anyway. So we've started the conversations planning it has been working with the agricultural fairground and um, to do the application through the NEC. So we have to make these approved uses. Um, and the museum has to look into um, the feasibility of using the barn for year round use because of course, school isn't happening when the village is open in the summer, it's happening in the spring semester. The win, win, win part is that would provide volunteers to Grey Roots Museum with the students there doing their cooperative programming on site. So we would have a new volunteer base at the museum. Um, we are going to be booking a meeting of all the interested parties to do a tour of the museum site. We're working with Jill on that, um, and that, that can happen soonish because thankfully we're in, we're in green zone right now, so that's great. Um, this is a long tail project. We don't have any timelines, but ultimately we would like to see this in place before Dennis retires, which is in three years. And we anticipate that it'll probably take a couple of years for the, for the program, all the elements of the program to be set up. So that's really exciting for us. This is a, the potential for us to support youth in agriculture and retention of youth in agriculture is, is great with this partnership. So um, I don't know if I should be addressing questions, but Brenda, I see a hands up. Um, go ahead there, Brenda, ask the question. I've got one too, so go ahead. Perfect. Uh, thanks. So, um, Philly, that's really exciting um, that there is, I think, Grey Roots is a great place to be putting this Grey County agricultural uh, high school major. Um, I guess part of me, I didn't realize actually that it had moved from, I thought it had gone to Hanover, but so it's actually in Owen Sound. Are you seeing a lot of take up given that most of the students there are Owen Sound? city kids as opposed to, um, is it possible to make this program not based out of the one high school, but something that's just based with the school board for access to a wider portion of Gray County? See this, okay, I will, I will answer from my limited information. Dennis Watson is really the person to talk to about this, but the way specialist high schools major works is each high school that participates in the program is assigned a specific focus. So Chesley used to be ag, it got moved because, because Dennis, who led the program, moved to Owen Sound, but other ones might be focusing on tourism or technology or automotive. It's, it really is school by school, and every school gets to have one specialist high skills major. That's just the way the program works across the province. So by making a centralized location, 
Um, students from any school can participate already. They don't have to be at OSDSS. They just need to get into the program. But it, I think making it at this location will likely make it easier because of um, transportation. It'll make it more viable for people across both school boards. So whether it's Blue Water or the separate school board. So hope that answers the question. All right, thanks, Philly. Yeah, my question was, um, how many uh, students have participated in the last couple of years that the program was off? That is definitely a Dennis question. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't answer. I wish I had come prepared with the answers to that. Maybe somebody else on the call knows. Nope, you know what, I'll look into that. Yeah. But I saw you. And, and uh, also if we can, you know, maybe in the future track where, where they end up, if they end up going to, you know, college, university, or stay within the business, that would be, um, I think, of value as well, and uh, would, uh, you know, help us kind of track some of that data. I, I see a few more questions here, Lori. Just a comment. Um, our daughter participated in this program. She went to high school in Meaford and then switched for her last year to go to this program specifically when it was in Chesley. She thoroughly enjoyed it, and it uh, cemented the fact that that's where she wanted to be was agriculture uh, and livestock related. So it was a fantastic program. Our Gray County Soil and Crop and Gray Bruce Farmers Weeks and Bruce County Soil and Crop all support this program through scholarships. In the past, I think uh, when Holly went, there was about 30 kids in the class. And I think since I agree, Philly, I don't have the numbers, but definitely the numbers have decreased since it went to Owen Sound. And yes. uh, it's interesting that you're talking about this today because I've been wanting to find out more as to if it's been dwindling or not, because you hate to put scholarship dollars towards something that isn't a, a productive um, program. So I thank you. This is fantastic that you guys are taking this on and I look forward to a more vibrant program in the future. So thank you. Mm hmm. Yeah, us too. Fingers, fingers crossed that we're going to be able to make this partnership work. There's a lot of goodwill around it. All right. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Councillor Robinson, you have a question. Well, thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, Philly, thank you very much for um, both updates so far. Most interesting. I, I'm aware of um, two uh, young ladies that uh, graduated most successfully from this program. Both were um, uh, both very interested in horses, but had a overall interest in agriculture. Um, I'm just wondering, committee members, if there may be a future role for us in some capacity or, uh, as a, a partner in collective knowledge on this committee is quite vast and whether there is um, some opportunity, whether immediately or, or down the road that we should be exploring. So I just wanna effectively just plant that seed and, and see if there's um, uh, something down the road that we could contribute to this most valuable program. Uh, Philly, any thoughts on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, go ahead, Philly. Well, I just think we're in, we're in early stages and all sorts of ideas would be, be welcome. This is, the door is not closed on this. We've had the initial meeting with, with the very tight group and then we're going to start spreading outwards and inviting contributions and ideas. So we, um, we're in the blue sky. If you wanna to come to us you know, with ideas, great. We're not, we're not going to um, say no to any opportunities until we take a look at them. Thank you for that opportunity. Appreciate mm -hmm. the response. All right, and I can, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure from the ag business side, a lot of companies are um, struggling for uh, people to fill jobs that uh, are and will be available in the future. So I'm sure they will uh, support your program and uh, look at uh, opportunities to, um, to help out if need be. So, okay, I saw another hand up. Uh, Scott. Thank you. And, and just to respond to your earlier question, Mr. Chair, uh, my understanding through talking to Dennis is, is the program has had to be put on hold temporarily based on the pandemic, uh, just in terms of not being able to, to uh, gather in groups and, and online learning isn't really conducive in, in some cases to the type of educational experience they're, they're putting forth. And I believe he said in, in the last few years before the pandemic, um, their numbers were in, in the high teens or low 20s in terms of class sizes, so. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Um, okay. Um, 
Philly, you're up again, I guess, uh, commenting on the agri-food workshop. Yep, last, last portion of my, my update. So um, one of the things that we can continue to do, unlike trying to tap a tree or milk a cow, um, we can offer online learning during the pandemic. So that is one of the places that we're focusing some of our attention. We've got some upcoming workshops. Um, the, the one that's coming up right around the corner, so starts um, next Wednesday evening, is a four-part series called Business Planning for Small Farm Success with Scott Kelland. He is uh, from Eastern Ontario. He is a mixed family farmer who's been at it for three decades. He is also um, a business management consultant specializing in small farms. Uh, and he has written a number of books and created a number of business uh, support resources like ex Excel spreadsheets that can be used by market gardeners and CSAs and other small farmers. So he's been doing this for a long time and has a lot of expertise to share. Um, we had a, 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 an inquiry to the Business Enterprise Center about business management uh, resources for uh, small farms and we realized that this would be really valuable. So we're offering this course. It is going to run for four weeks, three weeks of an hour and a half um, instruction uh, in business management for farms. And then the fourth week will be question and answer based on the participants own um, rough plans that they will draw up after the first three weeks. We're really excited about it. There are 20 spaces available. Um, and uh, as of Two days ago, 10 were filled, which is right on track with our experience. Everybody is going to join up in the last two days. It's just what happens. Uh, and uh, we're really excited to see the names of people that we have been working with in economic development and at the Business Enterprise Center, and also some people who we've never seen before. So um, we're excited about that one. In the fall, the Tri-County group that cooperated for the BRE, the Business Retention and Expansion Survey, a couple of years ago. So that is Ray County, Bruce County, and Simcoe County are working with the Henry Bernick Center out of Georgian College to offer a 10-part series that will start in late October. And it is going to be offered by the people at Food Venture Center. They're the people who took over the um, the food incubator that was in Toronto. And this is all they do is um, work related to supporting um, food startups, food businesses. So this is going to be specifically for people who have farms and want to get into value adds. And it's going to synthesize information that we've offered over the last four or five years in partnership across the three counties. So information about um, food safety, the regulatory environment, um, labeling, marketing, um, scaling your business, things like that, um, all under one umbrella. Again, we're going to uh, keep it very tight, maybe 24 participants maximum to keep, to keep focused on interactivity and success for the participants. Um, and we are hoping to keep it to under $100 registration for people who are in the three counties and maybe 150 for people from outside because we realize in the online environment, people want the information and they live where they live. So we're excited about that. Um, again, that's going to happen in the fall and that's just because we recognize that trying to offer something that lasts for 10 weeks in spring and summer is impossible for people on farms. So heading into the winter season makes a lot more sense. And the last thing that we are working on is um, I'm currently having conversations, Laurie, I think you'll be excited about this with Martha Rogers. Um, and Martha is a master preserver and canner. She's done a program at Cornell University to her year and a half to complete. And she is, um, she was teaching at York University. She lives here in Gray County. And she is one of the uh, most knowledgeable people in Canada around the food science of canning and preserving. Um, and we are talking about what kind of programming she might be able to offer. This would dovetail almost perfectly with the food venture course about on-farm value adds because the food venture is going to teach about the environment and the business planning. And Martha's going to be able to get down into the nitty gritty of how to do the things. So we don't have dates set. We had originally pitched an idea of a workshop every two weeks through the growing season, but the, the um, logistics of that might make it difficult. 
So we're still in conversation. This would be another tri-county program. Um, and, and I'm anticipating that it might be three or four sessions at this point, and it will build on the course that, that Laurie and Gray Ag Services offered last spring, was it, that you offered stuff with Martha? Um, and let people um, get some more valuable information. I am just going to go on mute for a moment. To follow up on what Philly's saying, we've worked with Martha for several years and uh, we actually this year we had a fermentation course earlier in the sessions and we have a canning one coming up on Tuesday, April 8th from uh, 10 to 11.30 a.m. You can still sign up for that. Martha is extremely knowledgeable and teaches extremely well, um, isn't condescending. Uh, Steve Furness came to one of her earlier uh, courses with us and said that she, as he walked out the door, he whispered to me, it's surprising I haven't killed my family. And so uh, <laughs> you can certainly learn a lot uh, from what she has to say. So I and look forward to the workshops that you're creating, Philly. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So are we. So so that's that's it. Um, happy to take any questions if there are any. Any questions at this time from the group? I think we're all good. Well, thank you, Philly and Lori, on uh, getting us up to date. There sounds like there's lots of exciting stuff uh, taking place. So thank excuse you. me. Sarah? Sorry, John. Um, Savannah Myers has thank her you. hand up. Oh, sorry, Savannah. I, I didn't see it. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, I'll be really quick. I was just going to say, you can see why Philly is the person that we need to have around this table because her update is much better than mine. Um, and I'm thinking if we can, uh, if it's okay with this group, if we can keep, especially the Chesley Egg Program as a, a standing item on this agenda for the next little while, because we are just starting those conversations. And I think there's a lot of comments to be collected and I could see a report being put together from this group to be able to go to council with a recommendation when we know more, because right now we are so early days, um, but it's such an important program and such a, a great opportunity. We want to keep collecting that information and then get that in front of council when we're ready to do that. So if that's okay with you, I could see that being a standing uh, item on here. So we can continue the comment collection. Yeah. Okay. See I think we all agree there. Yeah. Good point. Perfect. All right, thank you. Um, were there any comments or questions for Philly or Lori at this time? Sure. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Robinson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I really like these updates. I think it's um, most informative. Um, to Philly, is there an opportunity for this um, group to look at the data uh, that is um, presented through Connect Dawn? Or is that just totally outside of the scope of what we, nope. we could do? Absolutely. Doing? And that was one of the things that I confirmed with the group is that if I do um, okay. uh, data extraction, that I can use it any way I want. And, if, and this is exactly how I wanted to use it. And, and that is exactly what it's designed for. Um, and the answer is yes. The other part of the answer is I'm not sure when, because the project to incorporate our data into the system uh, ends on March 31st, we still need to be trained in how to get the information out. I anticipate that I'll know how and I'll be able to have a first report for our next quarterly meeting though. Uh, just supplementary, thank you very much for that and, and really appreciate the positive answer on that. Data is a language all of its own and it certainly um, contributes extremely well to decision-making or putting projects forward. So I can see um, data uh, even contributing to the Chesley Ag program or any of our strategic uh, planning initiatives that, that we will be developing. So that's extremely good news. So thanks for that. All right. Um, can we move on to our next topic? All right. Um, Scott, you have a notice of uh, open house for the forest management bylaw update. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief on this one, but um, uh, the county is, is currently uh, just starting a, a review of our forest management bylaw. And uh, this bylaw was passed in, in 2006. And this is a bylaw that looks specifically at woodlands. 
Um, so it doesn't cover individual trees if someone has a tree in their front yard or something like that. Um, it covers uh, woodlands that are one hectare in size or greater. And our, our bylaw was passed in 2006 and, and obviously things have changed since then. Uh, so we wanna freshen it up. There's some, some legislative changes we need to make um, and we want to make sure that it works well um, with, with uh, our planning process and our official plan, um, but also any, any um, bylaws at the municipal level. And, and we've been lucky enough on, on this upcoming workshop uh, to partner with uh, Town of Blue Mountains, who's undergoing a review of, of uh, a complementary bylaw at the municipal level. And, and certainly we want to make sure for any of our other uh, um, nine member municipalities that have bylaws that it's that it's uh, working with them and, and we're not creating any sort of duplication in that regard. I will say that under the current bylaw, um, there's really two types of, of uh, permits that one could, could uh, look at if they were looking to harvest trees. Um, one is if you want to selectively harvest in your bush uh, just for overall forest health and, and some income, then that's a fairly straightforward permit and, and it's a fairly quick process. Um, the other would be another type of permit whereby um, someone's looking to, to clear cut a piece of land. And obviously, as you can imagine, that's a little bit more involved. And in some cases, there's, there's uh, environmental review that's needed in that regard. Uh, there's a number of existing exemptions in the bylaw, uh, including uh, where you have a building permit. So if a, a farmer were looking to put up a, a new barn or shed, uh, then you're not needing a permit for that. Um, there's permits where you already have um, a planning application or where you're just cutting wood for your own use, like firewood. Uh, there's permits, of, or you don't need a permit, of course, if you have a, a Christmas tree farm um, that's a, or, or an orchard in that regard, so that's understood. Uh, and there's also an exemption specific to farmers um, for, for maintaining um, sort of the edges of, of woodlands uh, such that they don't uh, uh, encroach into existing uh, farms or, or existing fields or pasture areas. Um, so what we're really hoping for uh, from the agricultural community um, is, is your feedback on this bylaw. Um, if you've had any um, uh, exposure to it or, 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 um, or difficulties with it, uh, now's our time to look at making those changes. Um, and, and furthermore, uh, this first open house and then the subsequent public process uh, may also serve as, as uh, an education process to say that, hey, Greg County does have a bylaw, um, because we do hear it from time to time that, uh, oh, I wasn't aware you had a bylaw, and that's good to know kind of thing. We've tried to uh, promote it in, in recent years, and we've got a, what we call a call before you cut campaign. Um, but uh, um, as much as possible, we try to take the friendly approach and the education approach rather than than enforcement, and that's really only a last, uh, last regard. So this first session will be a... Uh, an introduction, uh, and then we'll have uh, a further session down the road once we have the draft changes, and maybe those draft changes can come back to this committee and, and people around the table can offer any input. And I will say one further thing, since the, uh, the agenda for this meeting went out, uh, our county website has been updated, uh, and there's a little blurb on the website, so in the minutes we can, we can add a, a direct link to that, which gives further background on the current bylaw and some of the changes we're looking at. So that's all I have, but I'd certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Councillor Robinson uh, has a question. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. So this is one of the great reasons why we have this Agriculture Advisory Committee at the county level. So um, the tree bylaw, I'm just trying to get the, um, the uh, process in place for decision making because it would be really great if uh, we could have this uh, proposed bylaw on the agenda that this committee could provide feedback on it. And uh, I'm just wondering timeframes like, recognize that um, the first session is beginning, but if this item was put back on our, um, or rather put on our next agenda, subject to us uh, figuring out when that next uh, meeting will be, would we have enough time to um, have the discussion at this meeting and then prepare any recommendations should this committee wish to go forward on it? So uh, Scott, just wondering if, if there's time frame opportunity here. So through you, Mr. Chair, 
Um, yeah, this really is just the kickoff at this stage. We don't have a hard and fast time frame for for when we hope to complete this project. You know, ideally it would be it would be later this year, um, but we want to make sure we get word out there um, to farmers, to to uh, property rural property owners, to to uh, uh, harvesters, um, to really get all the input we can. Ultimately, the decision will have to come back before county council, um, but I don't see any issue with um, with it coming to, to the next meeting of, of this group prior to, to going to council to make sure we get that feedback. And, you know, really once we have the draft bylaw, um, that'll help people to, to better consider um, whether or not there's any any impacts to them or, or, or further tweaks that need to be made. And like I said, it's it's those existing exemptions that might be of most interest to, to, uh, to farmers to make sure that they're covered and not having to go through uh, too much in the way of any undue process um, while still meeting the overall objective of, of providing uh, good protection for, for graze woodlands in that regard. But good comments, Councilor Robinson, Robinson, and we're, we're certainly happy to, to bring it back through this group. Councilor Robinson, go ahead. Sorry, I'm speaking uh, with mute on. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Scott, uh, for that response. It would be fantastic if this uh, uh, by or draft bylaw could be put on the next agenda. We've got a um, fair number of uh, cross section of agricultural um, sector representatives. So uh, hearing their feedback on it, and certainly there's the um, the many farm acreage has the pockets of one or two acres of of uh, woodlot. So um, I would be most interested to hear um, representatives from this board uh, contributing to um, any of the changes. Maybe there will be no changes because uh, we do know that uh, the bylaws are very, very well thought out from a, a county staff level. But I think the opportunity for this uh, committee to provide input would be great. And we've got advance notice that, it, that it's gonna be on. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Robinson. Um, any comments at this time from any of the uh, farm representatives? Um, Councillor Silver has a comment there, go ahead. You're muted right now. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, county for working with the town of Blue Mountains on this. We did start our own uh, process uh, over a year ago. Um, one of the issues that did come up is because there's Niagara escarpment lands and there's the escarpment rules there. And then um, then there's the county, which, which that's pretty easy because there's a defined boundary. And then there's the county rules, which apply to woodlands greater than a hectare. And then, so that's not exactly by property boundaries. And then uh, we, we had tried to do it by property size to exclude any farm uses, because what we were concerned with was developers and particularly, um, you know, cutting down trees, um, in advance of um, you know making development applications, so that they wouldn't be stuck with tree preservation zones because the trees would be gone. Um, so um, the so it did it did lead to a lot of confusion. Um, there was quite a bit of angst in our community, um, and then COVID struck. So and then we heard the county was wanting to update theirs. So we thought we'd, uh, you know, just do it in concert so there'd be good alignment um, with the county. But even now with this notice going out the other day, uh, we've already got a lot of correspondence and people are concerned about property rights. And uh, we certainly have consulted with our agriculture advisory committee here. And so um, the, it's, um, it's quite clear in our original wording, we, um, that's not even close to here, but anyway, um, we have um, consulted with our agriculture advisory committee and we made it quite clear that we would give a, a kind of a blanket exemption to uh, farm uses because we recognize that, you know, there's maintenance of fence lines. There's a lot of people that cut firewood. Uh, there's the need to keep you know, all of the uh, exemptions that are in the existing uh, county one, but even more broadly people, especially our uh, apple farmers, they're constantly cutting and replacing trees. So 
um, we don't want to capture any of the farm uses really in, in this. All right, thank you for your, uh, your comments there. Um, go ahead, Brenda. I'm sorry if I missed this when you first started speaking, Scott, but um, is there a date and a time for this? Like I'm not, this notice of open house is just sort of like, we're starting to talk or is there an actual meeting to go to? Yeah, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that, that was my fault. Um, the, the open house is, is on March the 27th and it's at uh, um, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. or 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, depending on what works best for people's schedules. At this stage, it is just a virtual open house just based on, on the pandemic. Um, but we'll include, there's a, a link to the notice of open house with the, the agenda, but we'll include a link to the, uh, the open house in the minutes, as well as a link to the, the, the county website that explains some of this a little better um, in, in the minutes as well. Um, there is, um, it is required that uh, if you wish to speak at the open house, um, that you um, you register in advance with the town, uh, just so they can they can formally add you to the call in that regard. Um, but there'll be more to come for those that can't make the open house. And and um, um, as Councillor Soever has said, we've already gotten some comments on this. And and one of the comments we've received is, well, listen, I, I don't do well with uh, with online meetings. Um, is there other opportunities? And 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 so we're certainly happy to to arrange phone calls or, or, or meet with people in, in uh, other fashions uh, uh, once safe to do so to make sure that we get all the feedback we can. Thank you, Scott. Um, any other questions for Scott on the uh, notice of open house? Uh, yeah, that is a neat little link. I, uh, I figured it out all by myself. So just click on it and the whole thing will pop up. So excellent. Um, well, I, I would strongly suggest that uh, the, the members of this committee um, at least try to listen in on that uh, on that meeting. I'm sure uh, there's going to be lots of information, different viewpoints, and uh, I think it'd be well worth it and would help out. But uh, maybe take the time prior to that. It's coming up pretty quick, March 24th. Maybe talk to some of your uh, people within your um, you know, community and, and see how they feel and make sure they're, uh, they're aware of it, that it is coming up. Thanks again. Um, any other questions for Scott at this time? I think we're all good there. Great. Uh, other business, um, sector representatives, um, time to share some information and important issues or challenges within your different communities. Uh, Heather, you've got your hand up, go ahead. I just want to provide um, a little bit of, of background and we wanted to put this on so that it would help staff um, gather a framework to bring back relative reports to the committee. Committee members can share some of that information that'll really help staff provide um, really um, responsive agendas um, moving forward with this group. So I just wanted to provide a bit of, of background on that. All right, thank you. Um, would like to comment first. Um, we'll ask uh, Kathy. Uh, Kathy, what's going on in your world? This Kathy or the other Kathy? Uh, sorry, Kathy Ekdeswala. <laughs> you, Kathy, yes. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Morning. Um, just a couple things that I thought I would bring forth today. Um, the challenge to the Bill C-156, which is uh, the Farm Trust Pact um, Act that was put in place uh, just last fall. Uh, the animal rights organizations are challenging this. And um, it's a big concern for anybody that's farming, in my opinion. Um, even from the fact of just uh, family privacy and biosecurity, um, I, I don't know if other people are aware of this uh, this um, being challenged. 
discuss. No. <laughs> Any comments from the group? I know the uh, the, the 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 law is um, yeah, it's there, and uh, I'm not sure if there's enough protection uh, for the producers at this time. We, uh, any comments from the group, Lori? I saw you shaking your head. Certainly the Federation of Agriculture, as well as probably other groups, Brenda can comment about to NFU, but I know Federation is working very hard to ensure that farmers are aware of uh, uh, everything that this bill covers. Um, it is essential that this bill is in place and followed through um, and that it isn't challenged because it is protecting uh, farmers' livelihoods. It's protecting our food safety. It's protecting our truckers when they're trying to transport the pigs to uh, the abattoirs. So uh, Federation has some signs available. At one point, you could only get the signs. If you were a dairy farmer, you would get a sign from the DFO. If you're a beef farmer, you get signs from BFO. Now Federation of Agriculture has a universal sign that you can post to ensure that people stay off your property. Um, certainly the police are well aware of um, animal activists as well. Luckily, COVID has kept the activists away, which is a good thing, but when COVID uh, goes away or lessens, we're sure that they'll be back on farm. And it is a huge concern, as Kathy said. And so, uh, um, but check out, Federation of Agriculture has some excellent information on their website if farmers want to learn more. And so, uh, I, and you can get order your signs through there as well. So uh, a good website to get more understanding about this great bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Woodbury, go ahead. I think uh, from what we've experienced in Southgate, uh, the other part to keep in mind with this is this protects the, the animals. We had uh, a group that left um, a lot of rabbits out um trespassed and, and let them out and it was just cruel to the animals as well so these some of these groups think they're protecting animals when they're harder on them uh than anyone uh, so yeah this is something that we've got to support uh with the agriculture uh, community all right thank you um Lori, go ahead just wanted to emphasize that not only is this bill important, it goes hand in hand with uh, another act, an Animal Welfare Act, that uh, ensures that farmers are taking uh, great care of their animals. So any uh, activists that think that we're going willy nilly uh, and not providing good animal welfare, that's false. It's one of the, it's a very stringent act. Um, several of the commodity groups make us follow certain regulations as well. So. Uh, the farmers are well scrutinized and they are doing everything they can to uh, ensure the optimal health of their livestock. Thank you. Good point. Uh, Councillor Robinson. So thank you. So I was just going back to see the uh, terms of reference for this committee. And as we're going through the issues and concerns and challenges that um, the agricultural sector overall is experiencing, I wonder if there's a, a willingness from this committee to identify what issues are and maybe if there's action uh, that uh, that we need to be taking whether it's a just a voice or you know not just but um, knowing the information is there support that is required even through a letter um, to the uh, upper orders of government um, that uh, identifies the support the collective support from this committee or any other actions to be taken so I'm wondering if that is if something that uh, we should uh, think about. If Bill C-156 is um, an item that we need to pursue, it certainly to me seems like um, it falls within um, representing the voice of agriculture. So just putting that forward to the committee and see where you wish to go with that. Thanks. Maybe even with Kathy, if she has additional information. Kathy. Uh... Well, Go ahead, Go Kat. ahead, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just going to add that um, from uh, for me in the poultry industry, what I see is a biosecurity concern, and um, to add to that, we also have um, uh, ILT outbreak in Paisley, which um, very few people that aren't in the poultry industry will be aware of, uh, which it's a serious contagious disease. And I can't remember it ever being in Grey Bruce before. Um, it's a respiratory virus. 
it's highly contagious. And um, when you put into place people that aren't aware of the challenges to our livestock and um, around this area, a couple of years ago, we had somebody impersonating a feed salesman walking onto farms and it's, it's a big concern. I think support is a great place for this committee to be um, looking at, like it's um, because it's, it's making it visible. All right, thank you. Um, how, uh, how would you like us to proceed uh, just with a letter of support for this, uh, for this bill or um, what, what are the suggestions there? I think that's a good start for sure. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Any other comments there? Savannah, did you wanna add something to that? We are just wondering if maybe this is something that Philly could do a report on and bring back to this committee, if that would make sense. Yeah, I see lots of heads. Okay, perfect. Thank you much appreciated. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Kathy, um, I guess, Willard, thank you very much for just starting what I'm perceiving as a roundtable discussion on issues and challenges that the agriculture sector is uh, experiencing. I was wondering if um, as we're um, discussing the issues and challenges that we're almost creating a chart which identifies the issues and then actions forward. So um, my, my hope is that we're identifying the issues and then also if there is a, a path forward, maybe not making decisions today necessarily because we would have to gather more information. So with uh, Savannah Meyer's uh, suggestion of a report being brought forward, that, and that's amazing because then we're having the information before us and uh, that we're, we're able to, um, well, read it ahead of time before we're at the meeting and then make the value judgment uh, when, we're, uh, when we're all together. That, that's just my thoughts, food for thought, if you will. <laughs> no, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So I'd, uh, I'd support that. Um, okay. Um, Kathy, was that uh, the only thing on your mind as far as uh, challenges within your sector or are there other issues as well? Um, that, that's what I had brought to the table today. Um, there's always challenges, so. <laughs> good, thank you. Um, all righty, good stuff. Uh, Brenda, uh, was, uh, no. Brenda, would you like to report um, on what's going on in your world, please? Uh, yes, there are a number of issues, hopefully a short list of issues I would like to bring to the attention of this group. So thank you that we have this space to share this information. Um, I actually was just on a call with our MP, Alex Ruff, the other day, just talking about some of the climate crisis issues out there and, and some of the things we can do um, in agriculture to um, to, to address the situation. And actually one interesting point that we were talking about was actually having more local abattoirs. And we, I, this is probably not a new thing for anyone here. It is right across all farm organizations that we all would really like to see a lot more local processing power. Um, and by power, I just mean capacity. We need more abattoirs. We need to find ways to help new ones start up, existing ones continue, find succession. Uh, strategies. We need to be able to possibly have apprenticeship programs to have people learn to enter the abattoir and butchering industry. I feel like especially in Grey County when we have quite a lot of livestock from a range of sizes of farms, having these uh, local small, mid, large, like we need a variety of the different sizes of abattoirs here to really address the, the volume of actual um, meat that we can actually produce. So uh, it's just something I wanted to bring forward. I'm not 100% sure how that works at like a great county level versus the provincial inspection level versus all the rules that are out there. But I feel that uh, if it was something that we all understood as being something that would really help uh, farmers right across this county, then anytime it comes up in conversation at all levels of government, 
we can put in our two cents and say, yes, let's move forward on this particular thing. And I also wanted to throw out there the slightly more um, alternative um, avatar suggestion of we also need to start being creative and considering how do we have licensed and very safe mobile abattoirs, which would also take care of a lot of <laughs> transportation issues to do with livestock. A lot of the animal rights activists, I mean, if you think about how far some livestock has to be trucked, and they're starting to think of they're starting to think of rules like, oh, they're only allowed to be in the truck for, I don't know, whatever, 10 hours or something. There is no way you're going to unload a bunch of cattle and then load them back on. And there's no way that that is less stressful than just getting them to their site. So, you know, if, if there were alternatives even to having to truck your animals at all, if you could legally have your animals uh, slaughtered on farm, and this, you know, this could just be a choice, the same kind of monetary choice that every farm makes to pay more or less for different services. But if this could be considered, that would actually just add another um, option into the whole bundle of things. And I know Manitoulin, I think, has one of these as well, because they're an island. It's terrible that the ferry a whole pile of cattle across to, <laughs> to the mainland to be able to, uh, to do legal slaughter. So it's not, the barrier is not public health. It really is regulation and that sort of thing. So yes, I would really like to throw that out there as something that I think um, that all the farm organizations can stand behind is more uh, abattoir capacity. Um, the second thing I was going to bring up is probably a little bit more controversial, um, and, but it does uh, dovetail into um, this forest management bylaw. Um, I think that we as farmers and you as councillors and members of uh, Gray County, the, the public servant body, um, I've probably been noticing a lot more removal of hedgerows um, on farms and you know beyond the the fact that it makes our landscape less pretty <laughs> which is actually the least of the problems there um, you know I, I just remember to myself like I've been to uh, Woodlock conferences where they talk about the history your initial history of this county being of like clear cutting of trees putting everything into agriculture, and then essentially having everything blow away and turn to sand. Um, and, you know, Paisley area, I've seen pictures of the Paisley area where it's just sand dunes and, and all this sort of thing. And it's been years and years of uh, reforestation strategies um, coming into play to try to stop some of this stuff. We also know what roadways are like in the winter. You pass by uh, open farm fields and that road is always terrible. In the wintertime, even if it's not snowing that day, if there's any wind, you've got drifts. And then you have more county and various municipal trucks out on the road clearing snow, just even if it's not snowing that day, just to try to keep these roadways clear. Um, I say this is controversial because, of course, it is a lot of farmers who are taking out hedgerows right now. But I feel like Gray County is like on a cusp right now. We still have a lot of our natural landscape. We still have a lot of farmers in place who do care about maintaining hedgerows and maintaining windbreaks and, and how that actually works with their farming methods. But we are seeing as land prices change, a lot more <laughs> farmers coming from south of us um, who are buying property that is more affordable than down south. And instead of coming into our area and seeing how our current landscape is actually an incredible thing, both for the environment and for agriculture, they're kind of turning us into what's down south. And I just did a drive down the other day and I could not believe the amount, number of lakes I could see everywhere after that 24 hour melt that we had uh, a week or so ago. And so, you know, I just think to myself of all the conservation areas, what they're talking about with flooding, when I talk about uh, erosion and just runoff and just loss of our nutrients from fields. Like, you know, that's not being kept to grow the uh, crops that people are trying to put in. So, and I say this is, controversial because of course nobody wants to be told what they can or cannot do with their land. I completely understand that, but I think we also as a society have to make a decision as well as what is important. So um, I know that the forest management thing is for this one plus hectare um, set of trees or whatnot, but I actually think the hedgerows are a pretty big deal and they're on like a, a priority list for OMAFRA and there's funding out there for it and all this stuff. But even having money available to people to like keep them in or beef them up or add them in the economic benefit for like real estate prices um 
like if you talk to any real estate agent, they'll tell you now, if you cut down all your hedgerows and you tile drain all your fields, you'll be able to sell that farm for like X million dollars more than when, if you didn't do that. And so I feel like, you know, if we haven't actually turned into that yet, if we could put like some, some breaks or just some more consideration into it, maybe we don't have to go that route out here. So, like I said, this is definitely not something that I think every farm organization would agree with, but I know for sure that for National Farmers Union, this is actually a really huge deal. And we're willing, and I know for uh, NFU Gray County, this is actually our big topic for this year to talk about our resilient landscapes because this is huge. Every hedgerow that stays in place, every tree that stays in place while still being able to um, do good agriculture is a sponge for the water cycle and maintains resilience for our entire county. So the only last thing I had to say, <laughs> um, and this is actually a little bit of a, a question. When a farm decides to put up a new farm building, perhaps an on-farm store, as we've seen a lot of and so on, have there, have there been a lot of um, requests for this lately, like building permit wise? And does that building get taxed at like some sort of a farm rate or does it end up being thrown into like a commercial rate? I know this has come up for other counties, so I'm throwing it out there because I don't know what the case is for Gray County. Thank you. All right, Brenda, a lot of, a lot of passionate topics there. Um, to get started, maybe we'll start uh, at the top of your list, the um, processing and abattoirs. Uh, it's been brought up a couple of times. Uh, Philly, you might- John, uh, maybe I can make a comment. Sure, go ahead. If I could, thanks. Um, I think one of the important roles that um, this committee can um, help us to facilitate is more awareness and education around these important topics. Um, when it comes to the mobile abattoir things, I know that there were um, projects and are some still some active mobile abattoirs that have been very successful. There have been others that have been tried and weren't successful. I think there's a lot to be learned from that work. Um, I, I see an article from Sustain Ontario where they kind of talk through some of the challenges and opportunities with that. And I'm wondering if it's an opportunity for us to bring um, somebody with that broad expertise to this table to really talk about what it would take to make something like that successful. Is it, you know, you need to form a cooperative and you, you know, you need to have this kind of base of people that are focused and what you need to do to try and, um, uh, you know, keep it successful in the, in the longer term. Um, with regard to the hedgerow uh, part of things and that preservation, you're probably all aware that another initiative that the county has ongoing is with regard to climate change. And um, one of the, we've been doing some work on that. We're coming up to a kind of a next step point in the climate change work. Um, there's a meeting at the 1st of April. The hope coming out of that is that there would, um, maybe we'll be able to put a coordinator position in place to carry that work forward. And if we did, I some of the benefits that you highlighted, Brenda, I, I think would be valuable for that committee to um, be aware of and to consider. And when we think about a huge part of climate change will be about education and working with our partners, whether it's the conservation authorities, the general farm organizations, other councils, but how can, how can we all work to help property owners understand the benefits of some of these kinds of activities and you know hopefully get some more uptake that way um, in the community so i can see some of these things coming together and the last question about the taxation certainly when mpac um, comes to do their assessment um, there's the house in one acre is assessed as the residential, then you have um, the property itself, and then you have the value added aspects of the operation, which would be taxed um, likely some form of commercial. So there are, every, um, almost all of our farm properties have at least a couple of different assessments associated with them. That's all I have, thanks. 
All right, thank you, Kim. So yeah, as you can see, there there's lots of information out there and getting the right information to the right groups and people, I, I think uh, maybe we can help and assist with that. Um, Cassie, go ahead. Mom, my understanding of the mobile abattoirs are predominantly for on-farm use. It's not meat for sale. Um, it, so if you have a cattle beast that's injured and can't be uh, transported to an abattoir, then an, a mobile abattoir can come in and process that meat for that farmer on his own property. So um, I, I think we have a long way to go to having mobile abattoirs that would be um, provide government inspected meat for sale. End of comment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, any questions, suggestions, comments for Brenda at this, uh, at this point? Add on? No? All right. Um, Amy, what, uh, what would you like to uh, see happening as far as uh, your area of expertise? Excuse me, sorry, John. I see Philly has her hand up. Sorry, Thank Phil. You. That's okay. Thank you. Um, briefly, we are in regular communication with Meat and Poultry Ontario, and they are they have just circulated a survey to look into the needs for abattoir across the province. So we're going to be waiting for information to come from that survey to help us um, inform any decision making. Um, because over and over and over again, abattoir has been um, recognized as a need, certainly through the BRNE. And um, the county has been working with uh, an organization that wants to bring an abattoir to the area and is in the very beginning stages. And we are trying to assist them in any way, shape and form to um, locate here. It's still early stages, but I know they've been speaking with economic development, with planning, with their municipal partners, um, with catapults, with, with a number of people in the community. So they are actively engaged here. So I don't have anything to report on it other than whenever the opportunity arises, we jump on it and try to make it happen. All right, thank you. Amy. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share. Um, I'll just jump in quickly about what we were just talking about, um, the survey that's going around from Meat and Poultry Ontario. They're looking for uh, input from, from producers as well. So we just did an on-farm or on-phone interview with the um, person who's, who's interviewing farmers about their challenges with processing. And um, I can pass on that the information for the person who's doing the survey through the chat box. And hopefully uh, that gets widely taken up by the producer community because it is um, a big challenge for many different reasons. So I had sort of four points um, that I wanted to bring to the table today. And uh, as Kathy mentioned, there are always lots of challenges. So this is kind of my short list of things that um, I thought were fairly relevant. Um, and I should couch this in, I'm, I'm a, a vegetable, primarily a vegetable farmer. We also do poultry and, and pasture raised pork and um, direct market through an on-farm store. Um, all of our products are essentially direct marketed. So one big thing this year, this past year has been just the demand and boom in local food, which you're probably all um, well aware of if you've been paying attention to the, to the news or, or um, just yourselves. And uh, which has been good in some ways, but it's also exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in our food system. One current challenge is um, sourcing seed for vegetable farms. That has been um, really, it, it's, it's been, a, it was a challenge last year and then this year, the seed companies that the majority of the commercial vegetable farms, um, smaller scale like myself, are purchasing from are three months behind in packaging seeds. And that's gonna put a lot of us um, well behind schedule if you weren't prepared and ordering your seed six months in advance um, of what you normally would. And it has got me thinking a lot about the vulnerability of our local producers um, because of the lack of knowledge and awareness around seed saving. 
particularly, um, you know, over the last however number of years, um, we've lost that as a skill. And there's there's some people who are doing it. We have some great local seed companies in our area, but in general, farms are not saving their own seeds, which leaves us really vulnerable. So not sure of the opportunities around there, but I thought that that perhaps there's at least an education component that could happen maybe through um, through some of the, the workshops that Lori does or Billy. Um, okay, and then, so my next point is also, um, has to do with vulnerabilities. I had meat processing on there, of course. Um, we've experienced it this year. A, a number of other producers who, had ex who are experiencing the boom in demand for their product were unable to book additional processing capacity. So they were unable to take advantage of, of the opportunity to sell more product or produce more product. Um, that as well as, as the processors, there's a really wide range of quality in the processing that is available to us at the small scale level. Our consumers are demanding a very high quality product. They're, they're educated consumers. They know what tastes good. Um, I'll, I'll use the example of sausages. Um, pork sausages, you can go to one processor and get really awesome tasting, um, well-prepared, properly ground sausages. And then your next batch of pigs might be going to another, another abattoir and the quality is so poor that they're, they're almost not sellable. So there's a real wide uh, range of quality, which is, which is risky for the producer because you've already put all that money into the, into the product and, and um, brought it to the to the processor and the product you end up with is, is subpar. Um, so that's maybe something in terms of, um, I know Philly's mentioned building capacity in, the, in skilled butchery in the region. And that, that I think goes hand in hand with building capacity is making sure that there, that there's skills out there. Um, another vulnerability in this particular area is in, um, we all saw the grocery store shelves clear out in March and then into April and, and so on. And there's been up and down supply throughout our food chain through the pandemic. Um, our area is, is a unique area. It's, it's, we're in zone four and five growing, it's fairly cold, but we do have capacity to grow and store a lot of our own food through the winter, but we don't have a lot of farms doing that. Um, and that is an area that I, I think is really important as we start to sort of examine our food, food system in a whole, as a whole in Gray County is what's our ability to feed ourselves. Um, and winter storage capacity and winter growing infrastructure is, is a big part of that. Um, so another point that hasn't been mentioned yet is um, this year, a lot of us who direct marketed moved our farm businesses online for the first year and we're selling online. And those of us who've been able to do that and um, take advantage of the of the online sales sales fronts that are that are available to farmers have done really well, um, and ourselves included. But I've seen other businesses do it, and uh, it's important to know that there's sort of like a certain skill set that's involved with selling online, and not all farms are are well positioned to take advantage advantage of that. And so um, I don't see that. I don't see selling online going away after this pandemic's over. I think that that it's just going to keep growing. And um, a couple of things there, I think there's a real opportunity to build skills and capacity around getting farm businesses online. Something like Digital Main Street, um, what they're doing in the Gray Highlands, but expanded across the agriculture sector um, would be helpful. And then also, uh, of course, building capacity in rural internet services, which has been a real challenge. And I know that there are some exciting things happening there with, with, with new companies becoming available, but it continues to be a, a problem when your internet stops working at 7 p.m. Um, and you can't really get any work done. Um, okay, and my last point, um, <clears throat> which sort of goes, is all around building capacity in this area. Um, I think it was mentioned um, in the planning report in our first meeting, this area is, is uniquely positioned to support um, new farm businesses and unique farm businesses and small scale farm businesses, which, um, which is certainly something that's, that's important and um, an exciting thing that, I, that we would like to see continue. 
Um, I am curious to see what happens in this area in the next five years as the land prices have you know, tripled in some areas. One of the big things that'll attract these unique businesses here is the affordability of farmland. It's certainly why we landed here from BC um, to, and chose to start our farm business in this area. Um, our farm has more than doubled in the price uh, in the last six years. So just something to, to kind of flag and, and monitor. And I think um, this new opportunity through Connect On to monitor the, the the agricultural landscape and the agricultural land use in our area is going to be key. That's that's a really important tool in the toolkit um, so that we can see how farms in this area change over the next over the next while as as the prices um, hopefully slow down, but probably not go not drop. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think that's it. I did want to jump in and talk and just mention a little bit about something that's really um, exciting that's happened. Uh, there are a lot of new farm businesses looking to start up um, in, in, in across the province. I know um, Everdale who has uh, a farm business program that's based out of a farm in, in Erin, Ontario. They had 70 new farmers in their farm startup business program this year, which is like just, like uh, way more than they've ever had in the past. It's all online. So um, there are people looking to, to get started in, in farming um, in our province and in our area. And I think as, uh, as much resources that we can provide to them to help them be successful, recognizing that this is an incredibly difficult um, industry to enter and to be successful in. It's important. All right. Uh, thank you, Amy, for your update. A lot of good points there. Um, would uh, anybody like to comment, suggest, Philly? One very brief um, thing that I would like to mention. There was a lot of great information there. Thank you, Amy. Um, last week, I um, listened in on a presentation that was a partnership between Nourish Food Marketing and Canadian specifically about how agriculture and food um, and how consumer habits will be changed forever as a result of the pandemic. And they published a white paper and I got that yesterday. So I would be happy to share that white paper um, with anybody. In fact, I can, I can point the whole committee. Um, it's only available to participants in the webinar and I was able to download it because I had been a participant, but I will create a, a, a PDF document and share it with anyone who's interested. It's full of very um, engaging information and a lot of it points to a future of online sales and um, a continuation of interest in local and sustainable foods. So it's not going away. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments for uh, Amy or um, to help with some of her projects at, the, at this time. Um, I, I think a lot of the points you made, Amy, are, are important to our, uh, our local producers. So I certainly would uh, uh, like to see some of those items on future agendas where we can uh, help and uh, assist those producers. And uh, especially with the, uh, you know, the online stores and, 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 and getting uh, farm produce to market. I, I think that's a, that's an important item and, uh, certainly not uh, something that's going away. Uh, Lori, can you maybe comment on, uh, have you done anything in your lineup uh, where that would be of any help or assistance to producers? With regards to creating um, online sales? For, yeah. Uh, we haven't done that specifically. As Amy had mentioned, there is a group in Grey Highlands that have been helping a number of farmers uh, get online with their sales. Uh, I know personally, I saw Amy turn hers around in, I would say 48 hours and did a fantastic job of making a very easy site of all of her, um, all of her produce, etc. It was amazing to watch in March and April how quickly these farmers went from initially, how am I going to get rid of any of my produce, etc, to being able to do such a successful job of having uh, online sales, uh, stores, curbside pickup. So well done to Amy and the other people that have done this um, 
it's uh, I, I think the experts are out there uh, in Grey Highlands and probably other areas as well. So we haven't got it on our list as a as a training course, but maybe it's something if we can find an expert that we could do. But maybe I'll talk to Philly and see if we can do something together. All right, thank you, Laurie. Sorry, Laurie, anything else in your department that's... Uh... Oh yes, I've got lots, <laughs> but I will make it quick. Um, first off, we have been doing webinars this year instead of courses. So we offered 10 online webinars and we have four more to go. We have an agronomy panel, a climate friendly gardening panel, a horse night, which we always do, and keeping up with canning science with Martha Rogers, as I mentioned. I know we keep hammering on this issue, but internet is extremely important and COVID has accentuated this. When online events or online courses or online meetings are your only opportunity to interact with fellow producers, if you don't have access to internet or access to reliable internet, it alienates you. And with alienation, it, it exemplifies farmer mental health issues. And that's another thing I'll point out in a minute. Um, but it is important and imperative that we figure out how to ensure that all farmers have reliable internet. We did run Grey Bruce Farmers Week um, all virtually in January. We had tremendous uh, results from people. We had people all across Canada and the US participating, but do you know, our participation from Gray Bruce was down. And I think that was because they didn't have reliable enough internet to uh, access it. And that's a real shame that we're providing this amazing now national conference it seems, but we can't even uh, let our, our local people uh, see what we're providing. So that is a shame. Um, so farmers mental health, it is a continuing concern that uh, the suicide rate amongst farmers is one of the highest of any other occupations. The uh, work that's been done out of Dr. Andrea Jones Bitten's uh, group out of University of Guelph has been fantastic. They're currently conducting another survey right now. The survey will be open till May 8th, I believe, where it's for all farmers across Canada to go in. It takes about 20 minutes to fill out. And uh, there's quite a few comparative questions about how your mental health is now versus the pandemic um, or versus how it was before versus the pandemic. And so it's a, a real way for the University of Guelph and others to learn about how the farmer mental health is. It, certainly it's a huge concern and I'm glad it's on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. The, there's a new program called In the Know by a, a, a group of people created this new session and uh, Canadian Mental Health Grey Bruce will be offering this in conjunction with ourselves and other groups. We're hoping that in April we'll be able to provide this uh, mental health awareness a course so that we can understand more about the stressors, how to deal, et cetera. We have offered two courses in the past at Gray Ag. And so this one will be an online course. And as soon as I know the date, we'll make sure that everybody knows, but we're working with Jackie Ralph to ensure that this can happen. And so uh, keep in mind, um, I think farmers mental health has, it's always been an issue, but the pandemic may have worsened it. So please, if you have farmers in your, your spectrum, your circle, please reach out and make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, there is a stigma even worse in the agriculture community, community than there is anywhere else. You know, it's the gotta be tough, gotta roll on. And uh, so please watch to see any differences in those loved farmers that you have in your area and make sure they're okay. Um, I agree with all the other points that uh, people have said and I've been uh, crossing off those items off my sheet. I did want to make, uh, I've heard lately about some funding cuts within the federal and the provincial uh, agricultural organizations. I know the feds have decreased some research dollars and so have uh, provincial OMAFRA has recently cut some research from OSCIA research dollars. And that's really scary because if we're not researching new techniques Etc. That's uh, we're not ahead of the game and not being able to do you know environmentally sound uh, advancements in agriculture, etc. So I, I'm quite concerned that those dollars are, are being cut from these various organizations. Another thing that I wanted to bring up um, and, and potentially sensitive, as Brenda had commented on a sensitive issue, this might be as well. I think it's wonderful that our real estate uh, market in gray is, uh, is booming and we have lots of new people moving into this area. But with the uh, 
advancement and, and people coming into our area could uh, provide some issues for farmers. A lot of these people have no idea what it takes to be a farmer, uh, the long hours, our implements on the road, the smells that are inherent with a farm. And so I think we need to be aware, first off from a farm implement perspective, our farmers are always challenged uh, first thing in the spring during harvest, et cetera. They're on the road, their implements are large. People don't have the patience to stay behind them and a, a, it's a huge concern all around but when those vehicles are trying to turn left the people behind get impatient and then they start to soar around that implement and it's a farmer that's at fault if he doesn't happen to see that that vehicle behind him is passing and so a huge concern I don't know whether we can do some signage or something but we need to make people aware that there are farm implements on the road they deserve to be there and they need to be treated with respect. Another thing, um, so as I said, the people move into a community, they maybe move to a, a place next to a farm. They need to be educated that those smells are a normal part of farming. Uh, the farmers work till two o'clock in the morning, so they might see lights in the middle of the night, but that's a part of farming. So I think just some sort of education to ensure that they are all aware of uh, what it takes to be a farmer and to be respectful of our farms. Uh, the escalating farm prices has already been mentioned. Uh, in uh, Ontario, there was an increase in farmland value of 4.7% in Ontario in 2020. And so the prices are increasing. And uh, as someone also said, this is a problem because um, how are new farmers want going to be able to afford land, but also how are existing farmers going to be able to expand their farm base, which they often do need to do. And the rental prices is getting extremely expensive or competitive as well. So that's an issue too. The other thing that the people that are moving into our area, um, they're dabbling in farming. And I use the word dabbling because they may not be fully aware of how to look after their animals. So uh, they may not have, know that uh, proper animal welfare. There have been situations where they haven't had adequate fencing. So the uh, animals are getting on the roadway as well. Uh, recently, Gray County BFO, beef, Gray County Beef Farmers went to Beef Farmers of Ontario to ask for uh, some new legislation to ensure that everyone that has livestock know how to keep them fenced properly because it's not only a problem for the animal if it gets on the road, but definitely for travelers as well, um, potentially hitting these poor animals. So those are all things to maybe, we just need to keep our eyes open as to how things change for the farming community as we have new people moving into the area. I think that's it for now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Lori. Lots of good points there, lots of uh, information. Any uh, suggestions, comments for Lori from the group? I think we're, oh, uh, Councillor Kiveny, you have a, your hand up, go ahead. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. And I uh, just want to first of all say how much I appreciate this group. The learning here is incredible. I'm so glad to be at this table. Um, just following up on Lori's last comments, and we had presentation at a recent council meeting um, suggesting that uh, in this area in Gray County that we're seeing a huge uh, number, I believe the number was 20% higher rate of uh, young people in farming than anywhere across uh, the uh, country, which is absolutely amazing. And as you're talking about new people coming into the area and, uh, and the uh, difficulties, challenges perhaps that they're facing because people are not really aware of uh, what it takes to be a farmer. And what, what I guess my question is, what are you as organizations doing to help these youth that are coming into farming and, and supporting them so that they stay in farming and, and that they're not uh, um, scared off, so to speak, by uh, any of the challenges that surround them. We've had a couple courses in the past um, about starting farms in Ontario. And so that has been supportive and very well received. Um, at those courses, we've noticed a lot of networking going on and that they, the first thing, I think the best thing for them is to gather close friends, gather their neighbors, figure out what their neighbors are doing. And I know Philly has done stuff where uh, she ensures that people are networking as well. Um, I don't know what other, maybe other people have ideas as to what we could do, Philly? Thank you. Um, I, 
I mean, there are lots of ideas and, and yes, one of the things that we were attempting to do in order to maybe help with the land prices and getting younger farmers was our, our um, landowner and farm seeker networking event that happened two years ago. Had we not been in pandemic times, we would have offered a similar event again this year. But um, I did want to um, specifically for Councillor Robinson um, say that a lot of the the 20% um, increase that we see in, in uh, younger farmers is accounted for by um, our horse and buggy communities in, in South Gray. Um, and again, that speaks to availability of affordable land because it's very much um, family lines and family connections and family trust and the kind of banking that happens in that community that is facilitating the growth in that community. So I don't have the exact breakdown, but I know that that it, it, a large proportion is, is horse and buggy community. All right, thank you. Um, RJ, did he join us? I don't see him up at this time, so okay. Um, as far as the uh, agricultural supply, I can uh, make a few comments there. Um, just, uh, you know, as a result of last year in COVID, uh, some of the supplies are getting tight as far as inputs in, into the community, which uh, will likely lead to shortages, but also higher prices. So just be aware that uh, farming is not getting cheaper and, um, and the demands for inputs uh, certainly will go up. Um, another item I have, we, uh, as a result of the, uh, the higher uh, land prices and such and real estate uh, affordability for a lot of the employees within the, uh, that support the ag community is, um, is getting to be a real challenge. So I certainly would uh, uh, ask council just to kind of keep an eye. Uh, not everybody can afford to buy a farm or live in a farm. So we see some of the, uh, the people that work in the industry move into town and, and it uh, isn't always affordable. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. And uh, um, it's uh, not always getting easier for those that, uh, you know, are involved in the Act Biz site and that uh, that hire employees. Uh, other than that, uh, the only other item I had, there are some changes to the uh, pesticide uh, regulations. So, uh, as most of you are aware, producers uh, will have to get licensed to uh, buy those products that were um, used to be available just with your OFA card, your NFU card, your professional designation. So they uh, they do have to take a course. There are still courses available. Um, I checked last night or a couple of days ago at Markdale, Chesley, and even Owen Sound, but they are filling up fast. Um, there, um, anybody that's interested, they can go to the uh, Ontario Pesticide uh, Education Program, and uh, there's a website for that, and it's uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, that's basically all I had at this time. Um, any other comments from the group? Suggestions? Did I see a hand up there, Councillor Woodbury? Yep. Um, just uh, a, a suggestion, actually. Um, we're, we have the benefit of one of our developers that um, uh, works very well with us and uh, uh, is pretty progressive with, with things. So I, I think if um, we could, or, or one of the organizations had um, an information a uh, flyer that we could put out about the farm tractors on the road, about farm smells, noise, whatever. Uh, I know uh, that uh, they give out packages to all the new homeowners and uh, they would include that. The other thing is, is that most of the municipalities, if not all, have uh, social media pages and things. So as we've seen before with Gray County, the more consistent we can be, um, so not just making up one for Southgate and a different one for, say, West Gray. If we had one that uh, was kind of generic to Gray County, we could all be putting that out on a regular basis uh, and uh, to, to uh, all of the, the followers on social media. And we'd be getting that consistent message uh, out across the county to help out. So um, I, I think if that's one route to go for... Uh, for some of the education and to help out around that. Go ahead there, Brenda. 
Thank you, Councillor Woodbury. That's, I think that's a great idea because it's so true. You come out of the countryside. I came from a city. I moved out here 13 years ago and was tried, tried to be respectful of what I found here, especially because I was farming. But what about all those who come out here and aren't farming? It's their weekend home or now it's their everyday home because they don't want to stay in the city anymore. I think that um, something to just educate very kindly great pictures, very welcoming to people as like a, a county uh, initiative would just be super consistent and would really help all, all of our uh, county get along with each other on the roads. Um, and with like, I've had posted in comments that I had heard from Omafra that they had so many more like farm smell, farm nuisance complaints, like the amount of time they had to waste trying to mediate between neighbors just because everybody's home, right? Everybody was home and getting on each other's nerves over this past year. So, you know, anything we can do to try to mitigate those situations before they happen would be just super amazing. And if we as a committee could like put our two cents into what goes into that publication, I'm all for that. All right. Um, is that something we can uh, look at, put together? Um, we need somebody to spearhead that. I see some head shaking. Uh, Philly? I was having this conversation with a member of our planning staff yesterday. Uh, this is something that has been identified by the BRE, and we're talking about uh, what Lori mentioned with respect to um, road safety around farm vehicles. Specifically, the conversation with planning was about land being taken out of production by newcomers who buy farms and decide that they don't like farming because it's a key and noisy. This was a new one to me, invades their privacy because of farm machines coming close to their homes. So there's a number of things that we would like to be communicating. And the discussion I had with planning staff was around maybe using real estate agents not, um, as, as a distribution mechanism. So this is something that has been identified. We're working on slowly and we can, uh, as a committee, push it up the list. And I'd be happy to work on that package with members of the committee and other people in the community and also with tourism because tourism is a very effective way to get that information out to the public. Excellent. I, I think there's definitely some merit there. And uh, um, like most of us, some of us have, we all know there's a lot of new faces in the community. And, uh, you know, the sooner we get them up to speed, I, I think it would uh, maybe make life easier for some of us, so, okay, some good work there. Um, any other comments, suggestions on hot topics? Lots of good points. Okay. Uh, Warden Hicks, you've been awful quiet there. Uh, you got all dressed up for the occasion. Uh, do you have anything to add at this time? Yeah, no, nothing to add. I do think that a, a lot of uh, good issues, I'm getting quite an education to be, uh, to be honest. A lot of good issues have, uh, have been raised. I, I'm hearing that many of them are already on sort of the radar uh, and uh, will be addressed, but I th think uh, we've had good discussion for initiatives to come forward in the future. All right, lots, uh, lots of information there, topics for uh, County Council to consider. Um, number five on our agenda, reference items. There's nothing there, Mr. Chair. There is nothing there. Um, next meeting, we, we like to set a date now. It's likely months ahead again. So I think we will um, look at schedules and we'll be looking um, probably early summer. So um, perhaps uh, mid June, um, but we will definitely work with the committee members to make sure that um, we find a meeting date that suits everyone. Okay. Uh, time of day appropriate for most people on the committee? I think the mornings are working well for the committee yeah. members, but certainly if they're not, you can you can let okay. them know that and we can uh, work on a different time. Excellent. Sounds great. Um, well, I, I guess if that's everything, it's maybe time for an adjournment. Uh, can I have a mover and seconder? Uh, Councillor Woodbury would like to move and seconded by Lori Smith. Thanks everybody. I think this has been a productive meeting um, and um, like to see you again. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks everyone. Good job, John. Thanks, bye all.